morning, everyone. It's good to see you here today. I hope you've come ready to receive from the Lord and to learn more about Him and to receive His grace. He is here today. Father, we love you and thank you for your blessings. And Lord, we are just excited, Lord, to be in your presence and to experience the move of your spirit. Your grace is so sufficient here today. Lord, you pour it out over us and your healing powers are flowing through this place, Lord, and we just lift our hearts and hands to you this morning in praise and adoration of you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I just, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would meet us here today. Lord, have your way in this place. Move in a special way. And Lord, I pray that we open our hearts to receive from you everything you have for us. In your precious holy name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there with open arms For God so loved the world that he gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in him will live forever Now it is well I'm walking in freedom For God so loved God so loved the world Praise God Praise God From whom all blessings flow Praise Him Praise Him For the wonder of his love. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, praise him, for the wonders of his love. Oh, his wondrous love. God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only. Son to save us, for God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. Oh, the power of hell forever defeated, now in His well. We're walking in freedom for God so loved, God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. He is waiting for you this morning to unload all that baggage that you have. He is here to take it away and relieve you and bring you out victorious Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah in 
the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. I'm gonna hear our praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive Yes, he is Yes, Lord, hallelujah I raise a hallelujah With everything inside of me the darkness leave. I'll raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I'll raise a hallelujah here you lost your hold on me. Yes, hallelujah. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive. Yes, hallelujah. Oh, we praise you, Lord. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. Oh, my weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. presence we depend on you Lord Jesus Lord you will take us through victorious and we yes, our faith is completely set on you my hope is in you Jesus as I worship you daily 
And I walk in your light daily, Lord Jesus. You are my strength and my comfort. And I praise your holy name. I glorify you, Jesus. You're mighty in strength. Hallelujah. You hold me in your hands, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Worship you. You are who you say you are. You'll do what you say you'll do. You'll be who you've always been to us. Jesus, yes, you are. Our hope is in you alone, our strength in your mighty name, our peace in the darkest day remains, oh Jesus, this we know, we will see the enemy run, this we know. Victory come, we hold on to every promise you ever made. Jesus, you are unfailing. Yes, you are. Our guide through the wilderness, you are. Our joy in the heaven. Seems to is no way, Jesus. This we know. We will see the enemy run. This we know. Oh, we will see the victory come. We hold on to every promise you ever made, Jesus. You are unfailing. We trust you. We trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. Oh Lord, we trust you. We trust you. Your ways are higher than trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. We trust you. We trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. This we know. We will see the enemy run. This we know. Coming victorious yes. for you. You will be 
victorious in the name of Jesus. He is fighting those battles for you. Amen. Keep your trust and your hope in him. Yes. Even when it seems like there's no way out. Even when we're in a fog. I believe Satan is putting us in a smoke screen. And he is going to be defeated. He thinks he's a winner. But he is in the smoke screen of thinking, I've got this, but he doesn't. The Lord is victorious. The Lord is going to bring us out of whatever situation we're in. He is going to bring America out of our situation that we're in. And there will be victory. Amen. There will be victory in the name of Jesus. I have news for you, Satan. You lose. God wins. Hallelujah. Every time. And we praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the victory. We thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have in you. Lord, we praise you. We give you all our praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. And I, the Lord, would say, victory may not look like what you expect. My victory will last forever. Your victories are short and small. But my victories will take you in to heaven. They will lead you where you need to go. It may not look like what you think it is. But trust me. Trust me because my grace is unfailing. I love you, son. I love you, daughter. I have so much abundant grace for your personal life, for everything that you're facing. And I will use that grace to bring you to victory my victory, says the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, give him a shout. Amen. Praise Hallelujah. you, Jesus. Lord, our Jesus. hope is in you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah, Amen. Jesus. Our time here on the earth is short, but our eternity is with him. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Praise you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we rest in you this morning. I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment Never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings You don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet Caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do just want you I'm sorry When I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry When I just sang another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry When I come with my agenda I'm sorry When I first got that you're enough 
take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. Caught up in this holy Jesus, you don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you I just want you Nothing else Nothing else Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. See it to him. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. Reach out to him. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else, nothing else will do. Caught up in your presence, I just want to sit here at your feet. Caught up in this holy moment. In your presence, I just want to sit here at your feet, caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me.
are we just what you fill this place, Lord? We worship you, Lord. We just want you, Hallelujah! Oh, we just want you. Blessed be your name. Blessed be. sit here before you just be in your presence father just be in your presence my savior my redeemer thank you how we worship you thank you jesus how we worship you thank you hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah, oh hallelujah, hallelujah Lord, hallelujah. a healing line that we had last week. People came forward. We prayed for people. I even put myself in that line because I needed some healing myself. And uh, the Lord had me go and touch a brother on his shoulder, a little touch, and I just was praising God and in his presence. And this morning, he comes and says, God healed his shoulder. Hallelujah. I wasn't even asking God for that. You know, the best healing is when God just does something. Amen. Just unexpected, just a surprise for all of us, amen? amen. And when it's God, it's real. Amen. And I know that we want to fill, we want to be his children. We want to lay hands on the sick. And God says we can, and they will recover. But how many of us have you know, tried and, and had some failures and, and uh, eh, right? We're, we're not there yet. But God, when he does something, it's done. Amen. It's done. And this is the kind of atmosphere that I feel like he can really work in. You know? Well, we're just concentrating on him. And that's it. And the song, you know, we don't deserve anything from God, do we? No. But he just wants to bless his children. That's this overwhelming feeling that I have this morning of his grace that he just wants to pour out on you this morning. He wants to uh, meet some of your needs that you don't even know you've got. <laughs> okay? Would you be up for that? I mean, he wants to heal some stuff inside of you that you don't even know is going on in there. I'm all for that. It's much better than taking our daily vitamin, which I do. <laughs> but, boy, God can really fix some stuff. So if we could just raise our hands up to him and just maybe sing one more chorus. I mean, it doesn't take forever for God to move. That's the good thing about God. He's just fast. <laughs> Amen. Let's just raise our hands, sing one more time, and really push in because God wants to do some surprises today inside of you. He wants to fix some stuff. Mentally, physically, emotionally, he wants to fix some stuff. So let's just raise our hands and just let him, let Dr. Jesus take over, amen? Caught up in your presence Thank you. 
Hallelujah. How many have loved ones that are not where they need to be right now? Yeah. Grab a hold of that promise. He's going to do what? Amen. He's going to bring him into the fold. We're going to claim that promise today. Amen. My household shall be saved. Amen. Amen. If you have an unsaved loved one, I want you right now, we're just going to, I want you to just raise your hands toward heaven right this very moment. And Lord, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus, and you see every hand that's raised in this place. And, and Lord, we all have loved ones that aren't serving you, that aren't living for you, that even know the truth and have, have I've gone, gone astray from it, Lord. And Father, right now, we claim that word that you spoke to us. We claim that in the name of Jesus, and we believe that our households will be coming in, our kids will be saved, our spouses will be saved. And Lord, right now, we come against the lies and the tactics of the enemy, and we command the blinders that are on their eyes right 
right now be coming down in the name of Jesus. Every stronghold that has them bound, those chains be broken and they may be loosed and they may be set free right this very moment. Lord Jesus, I thank you that there is no, no power that is greater than the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, the things that they may be tied up in and caught up in right now, they are going to walk in freedom and liberty and be set free in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord God, thank you for that victory right now. And we give you the praise and, gl and the glory in advance for these that are coming home. The prodigals are coming home. In your precious name we pray. And all God's people who agreed said, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, worship team. Praise the Lord God. Hallelujah. I think one of the greatest blessings that God can ever give to us is our households being saved. There's no, no greater blessing than to know that your family is going to be in heaven and, and they're right with God. It is, it is such an encouragement. Praise the Lord. I'm going to continue a series we were in today called uh, Who the Son Sets Free. Amen. How many are enjoying this series so far? I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed it, learned a lot, and I'm going to believe God to do great and mighty things. But before we get to the message, I want to welcome everyone to Grace Point Church today, where your past does not define your future. We, as a church, exist to connect people to God's grace. I mean, that's a good idea. Amen. And those on, watching online and, and those who are visiting with us today, if you're looking for a church home, we extend an invitation to you to consider to make Grace Point Church your church home. We're a group of people that aren't perfect, but we love Jesus. And we're on a journey to grow in our relationship with the Lord, and we would love for you to join us in that journey. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer before we get to the message. Lord God, I just thank you and praise you for all that you've done in this service this morning. And Lord, as we come to this portion of Scripture where we look into your holy word, Lord Jesus, may your Holy Spirit right now begin to touch our minds and touch our hearts. And Lord, may your Spirit begin to flow in such a way that we receive what your word has for us. Because you tell us clearly in your word that your word, word will go forth, but it will not return void. To go forth to accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. And Lord Jesus, we ask for that purpose of your word to be accomplished in our lives today. And now, Lord, we commit the rest of the service in your care. And all God's people who agreed said, Amen. Amen. So today I want to talk about being set free from envy. Anyone ever have trouble with envy? Well, if you look at Scripture very clearly, you're going to find out that probably everybody alive from time to time has a problem with envy, and it's not a good thing to have. Uh, so again, this series is called for who the Son is set free, and we're going to be set free from envy. Galatians, the fifth chapter, starting in verse 25, says this, since we live by the Spirit, I want to stop there just for a moment. What do we live by? Here. We have two choices we can live by. We can live by our own will, our own ideas, our own plans, and what the enemy throws our way, or we can choose to live by the Spirit. I don't know about you, but I want to choose to live by the Spirit. You know why I need to choose to live by the Spirit? Because I don't have it all together yet. Anyone else not have it all together yet? And there's times in my life that I need a greater power than myself to show me the things that need to be done. So since we live by the Spirit, then the next part of that scripture is, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So we have to stop, stop and ask ourselves here, what does it mean to be kept in step with the Spirit? Well, I, I kind of see my mind. How many of you have, you know, on Sunday mornings right now, I'm bringing my little granddaughter in, you know, and she's got a hold of my finger, and I'm walking her around the sanctuary, trying to get her used to the sanctuary. I'm walking her up and down the hallways and all that. And what is she doing? She's following wherever I'm leading her to. Well, keeping in step with the Spirit is me grabbing a hold of my Heavenly Father's hand and beginning to follow Him wherever He leads me. And the idea of keep, keeping, uh, uh, keeping in step with the Spirit here, it means walk in a straight line with the Spirit. And that ought to be something we all desire in our hearts, to walk in a straight line with the Spirit. Anyone agree with me on that? And then he shows us how not to walk in the Spirit. Verse 20, and verse 26, let us not become conceited. Now, this word conceited here means vainglory. It means a braggart. It means someone who has a false estimation of themselves. How many have ever been around someone like that? Don't look at your neighbor right now. 
That kind of person is a miserable person, right? So the opposite, then, of living by the Spirit and following the Spirit and keeping a step with the Spirit is becoming a braggart. And that's something that God doesn't want us. And then the next thing he says basically not to do is this. Not, this is how not walking in the Spirit here. It's provoking. How many provokers do I have here? You know, I know there's some people in the congregation that like to provoke and fun. And I can look back and I can see some people and I know exactly what you're doing every time. They don't mean it. They don't mean it. But they know if they just say this right word, and they're provoking for an answer. They're provoking for something to come up. And can I tell you, when it comes to the things of the Spirit, we are not to provoke one another. And the idea of provoking here is challenging each other and encouraging other people to do something that is not right or correct. Now, this gets a little, a little bit serious here. How many have ever been around someone, quote, who's a Christian, and they begin to tell you, you know, there's nothing wrong with you doing this just a little bit, or nothing wrong with you doing this just a little bit with this, and the Word of God is clearly against it? What they're doing, they're provoking you to evil, they're provoking you to wrong, and if you call yourself a Christian and you're provoking people to wrong, you're not keeping in step with the Spirit, and it's a very dangerous place to be. Can I get an amen there? And then it says, you know, let us not be conceited, provoking, and envying each other. And now what he's talking about here, envying each other, the main thing he's talking about is envying brothers and sisters in Christ. He's also talking about envying a world out there that's falling. And what God is saying here simply is this, that we should not be envying these things around us because it's going to bring harm and despair and destruction into our lives. Now, I want you to imagine with me just for a moment that one person at the office or that one person at church or that one person uh, at your workplace or that one person that everybody loves to hate. D don't think too hard here, okay? And this one person, you look at their lives and everything in their life is going correctly. And you look at your life and you're going, why not me? Anyone ever kind of thought that, honest enough to admit that? Can I tell you what that is? If you're thinking that way, that's envy. This person, they got the promotion at work, and they got the biggest salary of all. They got the biggest car. They got the biggest house. They got the most gorgeous spouse that worships the ground that they walk on. They got kids who get straight A's in school. And it's December, and they just got back from their Caribbean cruise, and they have a tan. <laughs> and this person, which we don't play lottery, but this person has won the lottery twice. And you're driving to work, and you see a car pulled over. The red lights are flashing, and you just happen to glance over, and it's that person. <laughs> And deep down in yourself, you're saying, get them good. <laughs> None of you would resemble that, right? You know what that is? It's envy. And envy is a very dangerous thing. The meaning of envy in the Bible here means this. The first thing it means is jealousy. We're jealous of what that person has done, what that person has, what has. It also means to covet. And what is one of the commandments we're told not to what? Covet. So envy and coveting are twins, if you want to put it that way. And this envying, this jealousy, this covetousness, it, it, which is the, it, w that which is particularly evil and deceitful. And the idea here is, is this, is that we actually wish upon them evil things, mean things, because they have something that we do not have. We're, covering, we're coveting after what they have. We wish we had it, they got it. And we say to ourselves, it's not fair that they have this and I don't. What's our society like today? What is it like today? Instead of rejoicing over someone else's blessings, we have, a, we have a society that's saying, why should they have it and why shouldn't I have it? And we're envying, we're jealous, we're coveting what God has blessed them with and wondering why I don't have it. 
And I want to tell you, that kind of attitude will bring harm and destruction into your life. You know, envy, envy is one of the devil's tools he throws out at us. And it's one that many of God's people fall prey to because we live in a society that, let me say it this way, is an entitlement society. We think it is owed to us because they have it, we should have it. This entitlement society is opening up the doors for socialism to come into the United States of America. It's opening up the doors for communism to come into America. And saints, if we don't recognize it as a church and if we don't recognize what's going on, we're going to see dangerous, horrible things happen in our land and our nation. And what amazes me, I believe they need to start teaching history once again in schools. Because socialism and communism has killed millions upon millions of millions of people in the name of fairness. All because someone was envious of what someone else had. And I, I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. If you see something that someone has and you want it, rejoice that they got it. But learn from them. How did they get it? Follow what they have done. I can guarantee you, if you begin to follow principles of people who are prosperous, if you've begun to follow their principles, you will be prosperous also, especially if they're Christians. But if you simply just want to take from them what belongs to them out of jealousy and envy, no one's going to be prosperous. It's going to bring disaster. You see, envy prompted the chief priest to deliver Jesus to Pilate. Envy caused, uh, 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 slanderous envy caused Daniel to be thrown in the lion's den. Envy creates an entitlement society, and in the Italian saints, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ does not need an entitlement society. We need to be a generous society that cares about others. You say amen? Resenting God's goodness in others' lives is ignoring God's goodness in your own life. How many realize that God's been good to you? How many are saved today? How many have an assurance that your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life? How many have that assurance that your sins have been washed in the blood of Jesus? And not only have they been washed in the blood of Jesus, that your sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. How many are so grateful today to know that one of these days that you're going to walk on those streets of gold? One of these days you're going to see Jesus Christ in, in all his glory face to face. God has blessed you abundantly. That old hymn goes, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Stop being so selfish about other people's blessings and condemning them for their blessings and env envying their blessings and begin to look at your own blessings. I am blessed today. If you're blessed today, give me a wave offering. You got a home to live in? You're blessed. You got a car to drive? You're blessed. You got food to eat? You're blessed. Did you just take a breath? You're blessed. You are a blessed people today. Glory to his name. Amen. But you see, our society is promoting envy. How many have a dog at home? You got a pet? You love your pets? Have you seen that commercial? If you want the best dog, you have to buy the best dog food. And unless you buy this dog food, you can't have the best dog. So they're teaching us to even have dog food envy. Now, how many have kids at school? They have envy at school. You know why you have to have envy at school? Because you have to have the brand names. And if you have a kid who doesn't have the brand name, and then they see someone who has the brand name, all of a sudden you have brand name envy. And our society is teaching kids that you have to have the exact brand name in order to be accepted, only, only to be valuable if you have the right swash on your tennis shoes. And I want to tell you, saints of God, right this very moment, I don't care what kind of tennis shoes you have because you're not taking any of those tennis shoes home with you to heaven. You're not doing it. And all these brand name things that you have to have that other people who are successful have... It's throwing you into a trap. And God's saying to you right this very moment, you are a unique chosen vessel of mine. I love you no matter what type of tennis shoes you're wearing. Amen? Amen? 
everything. You know, you go to the car lot. Don't go to the car lot unless you want to buy a new car because that's what's going to happen. Stay away. And what do they do? Wow, wouldn't you look good behind the wheel of that car? And just think how people will envy you because you've got the latest model. You've got the mag wheels. I don't know if they call them mag wheels anymore. You've got everything on there, and you will be envy of everyone. And what's our society teaching us? To lust after things that most of us cannot afford. Amen? You know, envy can happen to anyone, any place. And I'll just be honest with you here. Pastors can get full of envy. We go to a pastor's conference, and they always ask us, how many people do you got going to your church? And you have that one come up, 400. And then the small pastor church goes, Why can't my church be that big? And the next thing you know, you've got pastor envy. And then you know what? Small church congregations can have envy because they see the big church who has every program from A to Z. And why can't our church have every program from A to Z? But hear me. Speaking to this pastor, speaking to a church, God's called us to be who we are. Amen? And if God wants us to have a program, you know what he's going to do? He'll send someone in the church to have the program. And I know this for a fact. God wants the church to grow. He said, I'll build my church in case the hell won't prevail against it. But here's something. We cannot be envious of other churches who are bigger than we are. We have to be faithful and committed to what God has given us and using the gifts that God has given us here, right, and now. And if we're faithful to those gifts, God will give the increase. Can I get an amen there? Hallelujah. God is good. Amen? Now, I want to look at some reasons why we should avoid envy. And the first reason is this. Envy causes conflict every single time. Can I get an amen? amen. James 4 and 1 says this. What is causing the quarrels and fighting among you? Now, we've got to stop here. Who's James writing to? He's writing to believers. And now, don't they come from evil desires that war within you? And the idea here, what's causing these fightings, what's causing these desires, is you've got people who are quarreling back and forth, but they have an envy thing going on. They're envying this ministry. They're envying that ministry. They're envying that person. And it causes quarreling and fighting. Here's what I believe, saints. One person said, my idea of an agreeable person is a person who agrees with me. I don't believe that. But isn't that how we think? How many think you're always right? You, you're, oh, no, we always think we're right. Come on, don't we? And I know I'm right, and I know you're right when you agree with me. And if you don't agree with me, I know you're wrong, because I'm never wrong. Right? <laughs> oh, I hit pretty close to home on that one, didn't I? <laughs> You see, when envy enters into a family, it enters into a church, it enters into a workplace, it causes fighting among the people who are there. It creates the jealousy. You know, someone gets a promotion and they get envious because that person got the promotion and you've been at the place longer than that person and then that 24-year-old just comes on the job, he gets the promotion, you've been there for 25 years, you don't get the promotion. It causes envy and strife. You see... Envy shoots at others and wounds themselves. When you're envious of someone else, it's like taking a gun and, pull, you know, and, and pointing it at you and pulling the triggers. Trigger. You're the one who gets hurt. Envy hurts you. Envy is evil. Envy is something that destroys relationships. The next thing about the reason we need to avoid envy is this. Envy leads us to sin. Now, how many want to walk in the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit? 
That's what we want to do, right? I can guarantee you envy will kick, take you out of walking with the Spirit. James 3 and 16, where there is envying and strife, there is confusion, and look at this last part, every evil work. Now, how many want to blame it on Satan all the time? He's the author of that kind of stuff. I believe that. But I want to tell you, some of the evil we get into is because of our bad choices. When we choose to get into envying and we choose to get into strife, it's going to cause confusion. And not only confusion, but every type of evil work. This word strife in the Greek means this. It means selfish ambition. It means discord. The idea in the Greek here is that I am seeking and pursuing my purposes and my will, even in unfair ways. And I thought this was also interesting. In the Greek, it's also used for a political thing. It's talking about winning an election in unfair ways. Hmm. Well, we won't go there now. Okay. <laughs> and also, that word confusion means this. It means disturbance, unrest, rebellion, insurrection, disorder, unruliness, and it also means unstable. That's what happens. And I believe this is why envy comes into a, a group of people, especially in the church, because Jesus Christ knows if we're unified and we're one together in the Spirit, walking together in the Spirit, nothing is impossible for us. But a house divided against itself is going to do what? It's going to fall. So that's why the enemy brings this on so strongly. And then every evil work there, that evil work means vile, worthless, spiritual barrenness, laziness, and wickedness. And saints, I don't know about you, but that's a very good reason to avoid envy. That's a horrible, horrible list there. And, and, and saints, I can tell you, it is so easy to fall into the trap of envy. But we have to understand, it was envy that caused Cain to kill Abel. Amen? It was envy that caused Joseph's brothers to throw him into the cistern and sell him off into slavery. It was envy that the Pharisees saw that, that, that the Pharisees picked Christ on the cross. Envy is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. And, and a few years back, you may remember this. I'm, I'm not sure how, how many years back it was now. But a high school girl, uh, they, were, they had a, 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 um, uh, an election who's going to be the cheerleader. And one girl won that election to be the cheerleader. And another girl who lost was so envious of the position being lost that she actually went out and murdered the person, who, the cheerleader who won it. She did it all out of envy. And saints, envy always brings wickedness. It brings bad things. The next thing en envy does is this. Envy makes us miserable. Envy makes us miserable. Physically miserably, emotionally, spiritually, it makes us miserable people. Proverbs 14 and 30 says this, a heart at peace gives life. I like that. How many want life? How many want peace? That's a heart that's not bound by envy. And that word life there, actually in the Hebrew, it means health to the body, health to the spirit. How many want health? Whether you realize it or not, what you fill your heart and spirit with affects you not only physically, it affects you emotionally, it affects you spiritually. And if you're putting junk into your body like envy, you're not going to have health for your body. I should have been drowned out by amens on that. But envy rots the bones. Envy is like a disease, a cancer that begins to destroy you. Not only, I mean, destroys your life, it destroys your body. You know, how many have ever been in a situation where you're under a horrible, 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 horrible amount of stress? You ever been there? What happens to you? How do you feel when you're under a horrible amount of stress? Terrible things begin to happen. You even begin to have symptoms of heart attack, and you begin to have symptoms of this and all that because you're underneath the stress. Well, envy does the same thing. And I want to tell you right now, God wants to set us free from envy. Amen? You know, I am today so grateful for my little house. And why I had to say that? Because at one time, I had a four-bedroom, two-bath house in Country Lane, a nice lot, a nice area of town, nice big house. And you know what? I had to sell it. And now I've got a house. It was a brand-new house when we moved in. Now i got a house that's 110 years old, but I love it to death. You know why? Because I've learned that I, that house that I had to get rid of was not who I was. It didn't make me who I was. 
And now I'm rejoicing in that little house. You know why? Because my house payment's half of what it was. Everything's fixed. Everything's working correctly. And I am as happy as I've ever been because I'm not worrying about how I'm going to make the house payment. I don't have to worry about eating the shingles to eat. And God has provided me a nice little humble place. And I am content in the situation I find myself in right now. What society say? Oh, you should be down, discouraged, and depressed because you lost that nice big house. No, I'm not down and discouraged. I'm happier than all I've ever been because I am in a place that I can afford, that I love, it's peaceful, even with all the traffic. My granddaughter just loves it when the fire trucks and the, the policemen go by with their sirens on, run to the window to look at it. There is peace and joy having something that I can actually afford, and I thank God for that. Amen? Hallelujah. So, we can't say it's not fair. We can't say that, you know, things should not have happened bad. I want to tell you right now, if you think nothing bad is ever going to happen to you because you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not living in the real world. In this world, you shall have tribulations. But, 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 be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And if we think that, you know, we should never have this issue, never have that issue, I can guarantee you you're going to come down and discouraged every time they come. When those issues come in your life, it's not time to get down and discouraged. It's time to rise up in the name of Jesus and take the authority that rightly belongs for you and begin to stand up and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm more than a conqueror through him who loves me. And I will be victorious. Saints of God, we're going to be victorious because we read the back of the book and Jesus Christ is coming again. Amen. Hallelujah. So, saints of God, God does not want us to walk in envy. You know, and if we have envy in our life, and I know the Scripture is going to say we all struggle with it, it's time to get rid of it. Now, I want to look at five ways to get rid of the envy. Five ways. Now, you know how about five ways? There's probably five sermons, so I'm going to do it in one, so you're going to have to listen quick. Okay, five ways to get rid of, uh, get rid of envy, and the first one is this. Resist comparing myself to others. Resist it. How many ever, you know, I, I, I just love this. Some person's got curly hair. And you know what? They hate their curly hair because they like the straight hair. Amen? You know, and I, I think my daughter's beautiful red hair is beautiful. You know what? She doesn't want red hair. She wants blonde hair. And we're always comparing ourselves to what the other person has and wishes that we had what they had. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10 and 12 says this, We do not dare classify or compare ourselves. It's not wise. And, and saints, we have to understand this truth. Every one of us in this room have different callings, different giftings that God has given to you. We're not all the same. You know what? Some of you people, I envy because you're tall. <laughs> because I'm not overweight. I'm under height. If I just had another foot up here, I'd be fine. <laughs> okay? And I know there's some people that are so tall, they say, I hate being this tall because I have to duck my head every time I go through the door. I hate you! You know? <laughs> and we're never happy. We're constantly comparing ourselves back and forth. Stop that nonsense. You are the person that God created you to be and be happy how God made you. Amen? Hallelujah. You know, it is dumb, the Scripture says, to compare yourself to someone else. It's dumb. Amen? You know, and here's something we have to understand. When we start comparing ourselves to someone else, here's what you're going to find. You're always going to find someone else who's better than you are. Amen? You're always going to find that. I don't care how good you are at something, there's always going to be someone to come along right away or later that's better than you are at that. Now, how many like to watch the Olympics? They get the gold medals, and when we get that gold medals, what they say, we are the best in the world <laughs> until next year. Then someone comes along and it beats their time or they do something better, and next thing you know, they're the best in the world. Get used to it. There's always going to be someone better than you are at what you're doing right now. No matter how good you're doing it, there'll be someone better. And I don't have to envy them because they're better than I am. Amen? And also this, you're always going to find someone that you are better than. 
And that's what we usually do. We compare ourselves to someone that we know we're better than they are and we're not as bad as they are. I want to tell you right now, stop that nonsense. Special, special creations of God. Are we? Are you? And we don't have to compare ourselves. Comparing is the root of envy. It's dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. Galatians 6 and 4 says this. Let everyone be sure to do his very best. I'm going to stop right there. If we're doing our very best for God, we don't have to worry about what everyone else is doing or not doing. Amen. We don't have to compare ourselves to someone who's better or someone who's not as good because all I'm responsible to do is do my very best with what God has given me, the skills and talents he's given me, I do my very best with them. I present my gifts to him in such a way. Then, For then he will have personal satisfaction of work well done it w and won't need to compare himself with anyone else. Teach your kids this verse, parents and grandparents, to do their best. Hear me. I wish I was a straight-A student. I is a college student and I speak American English badly. But I guarantee you this, in grade school, my major was skipping. I practiced skipping in high school. Don't look at me like I'm a sinner. You did too. I even got on the phone and said, this is Mr. Kaufman. Gene will not be in today. <laughs> got away with it. You know why I didn't want to go? Didn't want to go, but part of the reason I wanted to go, I thought it was stupid. I didn't have the mind like everyone else. I had trouble saying words. I was different. I was odd. I was strange. So I didn't want to go. You know what I was doing? Comparing myself back and forth. And it brought harm, despair, and destruction to my life personally. That's part of, part of the reason why I'm so shy, believe it or not. I'm a shy person. You may not find that hard to believe, but I would rather be back behind the scenes doing something behind the scenes than being up front. God's got a sense of humor. <laughs> and you're laughing at it right now. Never mind. But something changed. At 27 years old, God said, go to Bible college. And I'm going... And when I got to Bible college, I had to take those aptitude tests. And when I took those aptitude tests, you know what I found out? I needed help. So because I didn't apply myself in high school when I should have, I had to take classes what we called bonehead classes, where I had to get caught up to where I needed to be. And the worst part about it, I got no credit, but had to pay full credit prices for them. But you know what? At that point in time, I realized God had called me there. God wanted me there. I stopped comparing myself to other people, and I decided I was going to do the very best job I could do. And you know what? I got on the dean's list. What changed? I stopped comparing myself to others who I thought were greater than I am and made a commitment, I'm going to do the best I can. And I graduated. I even got scholarships because of the grades I got at Bible college. Again, the change was I stopped comparing myself to other people and made a commitment to do my best. And I want to tell you, church, grandparents, parents, teach that verse to your kids for them to learn to do their very best. If they do their very best, they can be grateful. They can be full of uh, the right kind of praise and pride because they've done their very best. They have nothing to be ashamed of. Now, before, I had things to be ashamed of because I wasn't doing my best. I was running from my best. And then I paid for it later. God's good, amen? Amen. Next point is this, to get rid of envy, is recognize our uniqueness. And I know I've kind of mentioned this, but I want to mention it again. You are a unique creation of God. When, if we want to break envy's grip in our lives and, and not be unhappy all the time, we need to understand that we are a special creation of God. Psalms 139 and 13 says this, You, God created every part of me, and you put me together in my mother's womb. Now think about that. 
God knew who you were before you were formed in your mother's womb. God, the scripture and King James has knitted you together in your mother's womb. You are a special, unique creation of God. And I, I am so grateful for this. There's only one of you and only one of me. Thank God. Can you imagine two of me? I can't imagine two of some of you either. So even your thumbprints is unique. Your eye prints are unique. Everything about you, your DNA is unique. You are such a unique creation of God. It is so wonderful to understand that. You have been wonderfully and fearfully made in your mother's womb. God knew everything about you. He's given you gifts. He's given you skills. He's given you talents. He's given you a special mission. I'm looking in the front row. We've got a mission. We've got a missionary going out from here. Praise God. God's given missions to each and every one of us. You are a special, unique creation of God. Stop putting yourself down. Stop allowing the devil to lie to you and begin to realize who you are in Christ Jesus. You are his special creation. Amen? A little boy asked his mother where he came from and also where she came from as a baby. And the boy ran into the next, and the mother gave him this tale about a white bird with feathers. And the boy ran to the next room and asked his grandmother, Grandma, where did we come from? And where did you come from? And Grandma gave him the same story. Then the little boy scampered outside with the playmate and, and commented, You know, there hasn't been a normal birth in our family for three generations. <laughs> you know what? We're all special creations of God. Amen? Hallelujah. And no one is ever going to be like you. Envy is an expression of inferiority. You envy when you don't feel good about yourself. You feel inferior. Stop that nonsense. Uh, Psalms 113 and 15, 139 and 15 says this, You saw me before I was born and scheduled every day of my life before I began to breathe. I like that, the living Bible. He scheduled a plan for us. And that plan is victory. Amen? And hear me, God has a plan. Now, you say, in that plan, I'm going to say this again, God's got a plan that doesn't mean everything in this life will go easy. Didn't say everything in this life will be fair. <laughs> I wish it did. Anyone wish it did with me? Oh, I wish it did. But have to understand, even when we make bad choices, even when the devil is attacking us, my God's got a way of taking that and turning it around to make it work and fit into his perfect plan that he has for us. Romans 8 and 28, you know this. And we know with confidence all things work together for the good to them who love God and them who are called according to his purpose. How many love God today? Amen. Then you have to declare this. I know. I know my God is working all things. That situation you had at work that's not right. That situation you had in the family is not right. That dumb knucklehead thing you did is not right. God still has a plan, and he knows how to take our messes. He knows how to take those things and cause something good to come out of it. To plug it right back into his schedule to get us right where we need to go. I am so grateful for that, per that, that's, that's, that portion of Scripture. I quote that quote, portion of Scripture a lot. Say amen. I don't envy and you don't envy me because God's got a plan and design for your life. Leads me to the next way to get rid of envy. This one you're going to like. Rejoice and be grateful in what we have. Rejoice and be grateful in what we have. How many are grateful for what you have? Now, may I ask you a question? How many have ever given something to maybe one of your nieces or nephews and, and, and you know, one, uh, maybe one of your own kids and they look at it and go, what am I supposed to do with that? What do you want to do for them? Are you going to rush right out and say, I have another great gift for you? Is that what you're going to do? <laughs> Not at all. We're going to say, that's it. That's done. How many want God's blessings? Then be grateful for what you have already and show thanksgiving and rejoice in what God has done for you. You know, I think sometimes we get so busy with our lives and we overlook the blessings that God has given to us when we need to rejoice and be glad in them. We need to rejoice. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, it was Thanksgiving season in a nursing home 
and a small residential population were gathered there for their humble Thanksgiving dinner. And the director asked each to take a turn to express one thing they were grateful for. And, and, and thanks were expressed for the home they were able to stay in, the family where they were at. But one little old lady in her turn said, I thank the Lord for two perfectly good teeth, one in my upper jaw and one in my lower jaw that match so I can chew my food. <laughs> you know, so, well, that sounds silly, that sounds great. But you know what? That's the kind of attitude we have. We need to have. I am so grateful for what I have. You say Amen. Hallelujah. Philippians 4 and 11 says this, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am wherewith to be content. Oh, this is getting to some meddling here. How many love to be content in the state that you find yourself in? Well, content here in the, in the Greek means this. It means I'm content to serve the Lord fully no matter what circumstances I face. I'm content to be happy in the situation I find myself in. I'm going to be content in Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean we don't have ambitions? No. When, when our ambitions line up with God's will, that means, and we're not envious of someone else who's doing good, that doesn't mean we don't try to strive to improve ourselves. I'm just not envious of someone who's already there. Okay, but I need to learn to be content. How many content people do I have here? A few. You know what happens when you're not content? You try to fill that loneliness with something else. Maybe a bad relationship, maybe a bad purchase, maybe uh, something that you shouldn't be doing because you're not content. And you think you've got to have more, you've got to have more, got to have more, there's got to be more. And here's what happens. When you're not content, you'll step outside God's will. And when you step outside God's will, you make bigger messes and more things for God to clean up. But I've got to learn to be content. So the Apostle Paul said, I am learned to be content no matter what situation. And he's talking about being wrecked uh, on, on ships that, are, uh, have been, uh, you know, that have been wrecked and, and lashings and beatings and, and being with and without. And he just said, I just learned to be content in Jesus. Saints of God, I think there's a secret there that we all need. I need to be content in my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know when it's all said and done, I'm going to be victorious because here's my assurance. My God will meet all my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus my Lord, and I don't have to rush ahead of him. I just learned to be content and serve him where I am right now. That's good preaching, whether you like it or not. Amen. Hallelujah. God's good. I got to speed through here, and everyone who agrees said, the next thing here to get rid of envy is this. Respond in love. Respond in love. Now, this can get very hard, especially if the person you're envious of is bragging about what they've got and what they've done. How do we respond? In love. 1 Corinthians 13 and 4 says this. You ready for it? Love is patient. How many are patient? <laughs> I remember one, one of our members who've gone on to be with Jesus, every time she prayed for patience, she got pregnant. Love is kind. It does not envy, nor does it boast, nor is it proud. And that simply means this, saints of God, is that we have to learn to rejoice with those who rejoice. If God has blessed someone abundantly, we need to learn to rejoice with them and their blessings and what God has done in their lives instead of getting angry and envious because it hasn't happened to us. We need to learn to rejoice. And no matter what, if they're rejoicing over something that's good in their lives, we need to rejoice with them. And then we also need to learn through love to mourn with those who are mourning. We need to learn to rejoice. And here, we need to re learn to rejoice in the Lord always. I think it's time for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to start being a happy people again. We need to be happy that we're saved. We need to be happy we're serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And the world needs to see us happy, even what's going on in our land, going on in our nation, what's going on. We still need to be a happy people. They already know doom and gloom. And the worst thing they need to see is doom and gloom in us. You know, I, I know I've said this many times. Sometimes us Christians have been baptized in dill pickle juice. 
You know, we need to be happy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. A merry heart does good like a medicine. There's a lot in Scripture talking about being happy. And you know what? Being happy sometimes comes down to our choice. We choose to be happy. I choose not to allow your crazy things you said to me to hurt me. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to choose to rejoice when you got the big promotion and I didn't get it. I'm going to choose to rejoice and be happy. I choose to do that. He said, Amen. Love does not envy. Envy is the opposite of love in this portion of Scripture. Two storekeepers were bitter rivals and very envious of each other's business. And their stores were located directly across the street from each other. And they would peer out their windows and seeing who got what customer. And when a customer came to the other store, the other one would smell great big like, ha, ha, I got this one. Well, one night an angel appeared to one of the shopkeepers in a dream and said, I will give you anything you ask, but whatever you receive, your competitor will receive twice as much. You wish to be rich, you can be really, really, really rich, but your competitor will be twice as rich. You want a long, healthy life? <laughs> you can have a long, healthy life, but his life will be longer and healthier than yours. What's your desire? What would you want? And the man frowned, thought about it for a moment, and he said, here's my request. Strike me blind in one eye. Because remember, the other guy got double. That's what envy does for us. It brings harm and destruction. The Scripture says this, we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. There is nothing wrong with loving yourself the right way. God wants us to love ourselves. He died for you. Now, hear this. God did not die for junk. God so loved us that he died to redeem us, to purchase us, to buy us back from the chains of hell and to buy us back from the kingdom of darkness. Whether you want to believe this or not, before you were saved, you were a child of the devil. Your future was eternity separated from God in a place called hell. But our God came around and said, you're not junk. I created you. You're special. I created you. And I am going to buy you back. It's called redemption. He bought us back. And now we become his children. We have a new king, and we belong to a new kingdom. I don't know about you. I am grateful that I have been redeemed today. I am so grateful I've been bought back. That's how special we are to God. And if God loves us that much, guess what? We need to love ourselves also. Why is there so much hate in the world? I'll tell you why. You can't love someone else unless you first love yourself. And there are so many people out there who don't love themselves. They hate themselves. And because they hate themselves, they puke hate on everyone around them. And what will change that is they learn what Christ has done for them, that God loves them. And you know what? It's a great thing for that to happen. Now, I want to tell you right now, it's not natural for us not to envy. It's part of our fallen nature. But it's something we can learn to do differently. And it's not natural for a lot of people to love themselves. That's something we have to learn because we've been imprinted with all the negative things that society says. We hear the devil speaking about us. We hear what people say about us. And it becomes part of our quote, spiritual DNA. It's time to stop believing the reports of the lies of the enemy and start believing the report of the Lord. Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that, that, that weep. The next thing to get rid of envy is this. Refocus on pleasing God. And I am winding down. Everyone said amen, okay? Refocus on pleasing God. Hey, here's something that I have learned and I need to learn it over and keep applying it. I am not going to give an account to any man. I'm going to give an account one day to Jesus Christ. And so my focus here on earth needs to be focusing on how do I please my Lord? How do I walk in, in the step with the Spirit? How do I fulfill the gifts that God's given me? How do I do these things? And if my focus then is on pleasing other people, it's not going to be important what my coworkers think about my tennis shoes. It's not going to be important what people think about my hairstyle at school if I'm in school. It's not going to be important if I don't have designer jeans. 
But I want to tell you something. When God created you in his mother's womb, he gave you designer genes, just a different set. Awesome designer genes. Amen? Colossians 3 and 2 says this. Set your affections on things above and not on the things of this earth. And the idea here is simply this. We've got to start looking at things at God's viewpoint. How does God look at this? How does God take care of this? How does God want us to be in this situation? And begin focusing on his viewpoint and not man. And here's something I discovered, and I know you've discovered too. God's viewpoint and the world's viewpoint are opposites. There's this horrible thing going on in, in, in a neighboring city over here where they're trying to pass an ordinance that's just immoral as immoral can be because they have a different viewpoint. They're focusing on the enemy and the kingdom down here, and we as God's people need to be focused on up there and begin to pray for those things to come down in the name of Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Hallelujah. God is good. Hallelujah. Proverbs 23, 17 through 18 says this. Do not let your heart envy sinners. Now, we've been talking about envying brothers and sisters quite a bit, but guess what? We don't need to be envying sinners at all. We look at some of these people out there who are, quote, the big actors, the big athletes who are horrible, horrible role models for our, for our kids in society. You know, the rap type of music that's going on out there, some of that stuff is as, as immoral as immoral can be. You can post it on Facebook, but if you post something else on Facebook they disagree with, it's political, they take that down. Saints, don't envy the sinners. Don't envy them. Don't look at them and say, look, how do they have all those things? And here's something we have to realize, and I, I know I said it before. Life is not fair. It just simply isn't. But don't let your heart envy the sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord, the fear is respect. There, surely, there is surely a future hope for you, and a hope you, and, and your hope will not be cut off. Saints, if I don't envy sinners, I know this. God's got a future hope for me. Amen? And you say right now, well, I don't see that. I see bad people prospering. I see this one prospering. I see that one prospering. One thing you're forgetting, the books haven't been settled yet. Because one of these days, the books will be settled. And it may not be settled right this very moment here on earth because God's given room for repentance and people to change. But one of the days, the books will be settled. And if I have been faithful to the Lord, hallelujah, zealous for the Lord, I'm going to hear, well done, my good and faithful servants. But if I'm envious of sinners and making my life like theirs, I may hear something different. So don't envy the sinners. So today, honestly, between you and the Lord, if there's something that you're envious of, someone else or some unbeliever, I want to tell you today, get rid of that envy and learn to put your hope, your faith, and trust in Jesus Christ because he has made you that new creation. He's made you that unique person, and you are special before God. Can I get an amen there? You're special. Hallelujah. God is so good. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you and praise you so much for this day and for your goodness and your love and your mercy that you've given to each and every one of us. And Lord, I thank you that we can be set free from envy today. If you're in this room today or watching online and hearing this message and you're struggling with envy, right this very moment, just between you and the Lord, I'd say, Lord, this moment I cast this envy to you. I repent of this envy and I turn away from it. And I ask now for the power of your spirit to fill my life, to walk in your peace, your strength, and your joy, that I can be victorious over this envy and be faithful and zealous for your kingdom. In your name we pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, if, if you're here in the room today or watching online and you have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to tell you, he loves you. He died for you. You're special to him. He loved you so much that he, that he gave his life, that you could spend eternity in, in heaven with him and have every one of the sins you've ever committed forgiven. Because the Bible says clearly, all who call upon his name shall be saved. If you're here today and you've never asked Christ into your heart and life, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. If you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, I just want you to look at me just for a moment. Catch my eyes. Yes, there's, there's someone else. I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior today. There's nothing you have done in the past that's so terrible he will not forgive if you simply ask him to do it. I need Jesus today. Anyone else in this room today, I need Jesus. Those online and here in this room, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord, I come to you this moment. I humbly present myself to you with all my sin, with all my failures, and all my weaknesses. And I ask you now, Lord, to cleanse me and forgive me of all that I've done wrong. 
Lord Jesus, this morning, I confess that you are now my Lord and my Savior. Lord Jesus, today, I receive that grace. I receive that mercy. And from this moment on, I pledge my life, my love, and my service to live for you. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. If you said that prayer with me here or online and sincerely meant it, this morning God looks at you as totally clean, totally forgiven, and you are now the righteousness of God in Christ. And I want to encourage you, if you don't have a good church home, find a church home that you can, that you, that you can go to and learn about the Word of God, and I'll give you an invitation. Consider Grace Point Church. We love Jesus, and we love to connect people to His grace. In his name, we, we do those things in his name. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you in Jesus' name. We'll see you the next, the next appointed time.